For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson, with a cheery reminder that if you find our videos helpful and want to tell the world, we'd welcome a brief video clip telling us, and the world, why you like them. You can send that to info at climatedn.com. And I'm also cheery, and you can do that video if you want, because the power is still on. I know, I know, we take it for granted. It's like getting up in the morning and not particularly noticing that your house or apartment didn't burn down. You know, sometimes we forget to be grateful and instead we grumble about stuff like our tap is too loud or something. But the fact is, we do enjoy, and we should remember that we enjoy, a great many blessings, including reliable energy. And we should spare thought for the enormous number of people who don't. And when it comes to reliable energy, the people who suffer terribly because they haven't got it, in every area from keeping warm to having enough to eat to getting clean water. I bring all this up now particularly because it was all fun and games calling fossil fuels bad and unnecessary and smelly denier funding pollution until that cyber attack on the colonial pipeline that supplies many of the East Coast refineries in the United States and the threatened closure of the Enbridge 5 line carrying nearly half the petroleum that's needed in Ontario and Quebec through Michigan, whose governor wants to cut it off. Suddenly it wasn't just an undergraduate seminar, a fancy conference, a cocktail party, or a speech crammed with cheap applause lines. It was the real prospect of millions of citizens in advanced economies lacking energy. Mercifully not in the short run under the same weather conditions they saw in Texas in February. And mercifully, Colonial seems to have gotten its pipeline back online quickly, though unfortunately it apparently paid a $5 million ransom in Pake Kipling, if once you have paid him the Bitcoin, you will never be rid of the hacker. Also fortunately for Canada, Enbridge has so far refused to shut its pipeline down unless legally forced to. But it's worth remembering that everybody who's anybody is now totally on board with that net zero plan that means shutting down a lot of that kind of pipeline by 2030 and all of them by 2050. And then what? Even the prospect of their constituents going without energy for a few weeks had politicians pivoting smoothly from hating pipelines to loving them. But in the long run, this circular tube cannot be squared. In pocket Ben Franklin, when the wells dry, we know the worth of oil. Which ought to have made it one of those famous teachable moments, if only the pupils in question were teachable. And they'd certainly be more teachable if they could just wrap their minds around this perennial issue of trade-offs including a very awkward one that surfaced recently with respect to climate, namely the extent to which solar panels are made with slave labor in China. Because most people who are big on climate alarmism are also very big on human rights, or so they claim. But even if solar is cheap enough to be competitive without subsidies, and that's a big if, what is an activist to do if it's only cheap enough because the panels are produced by people literally kept behind barbed wire by PLA personnel with QBZ-95s? Now at CDN, we're a credit where credit is due outfit, and in this case, credit is due to The Guardian, which is often a target of our barbs, because it commendably printed this story about oppressed Uyghurs in Xinjiang being forced, among other things, to produce the polysilicon used in many of the world's solar panels, including an estimated 40% in Britain. So, are we now going to shop elsewhere and pay more for our solar, or are we going to pretend it didn't happen and hope it's gone in the morning? like the British Ministry of Green Defence, that burbled about its vast solar farm in East Yorkshire, quote, We have robust procedures in place that allow us to vet and routinely monitor all aspects of our supply chain, end quote. And you can take that to the bank. The Fog Bank. In the newsletter, we also note that the hottest year ever trademark is a bit overdue, with unusually cold spring weather in much of the Northern Hemisphere and an early autumn in the Southern. And the Japanese Meteorology Agency, yes, it's a globalized world, telling us that France, Ireland, and Finland have seen no warming in March over 30 years, while University of Alabama Huntsville satellite data tell us that globally this April is not warmer than 20 years ago, or indeed than April's in the late 1980s. If that news tempts you to relax and crack a cold one, the No Fun Brigade is standing ready with torched earth ale, intended to horrify you with, quote, the kind of ingredients that would be available in a climate-ravaged future, including smoke-tainted water, drought-resistant grains, shelf-stable extracts, and dandelion weeds, end quote, instead of hops. Now, that same firm also offers, quote, America's first certified carbon-neutral beer, end quote, which we assume means at the very least that it's gone flat. 
Meanwhile, the Telegraph tells us that experts say we're going to eat weeds, and some guy in the New York Times is glad people are showering less thanks to the pandemic because, quote, bathing less equals better skin and a cleaner planet, end quote. Well, I'm not sure about that, but it sure scrubs your social calendar in a hurry. If you're looking at all this and the attacks on keeping dogs and cats and thinking the alarmist movement has become dreary or even dismal, don't worry. They're also cranking out childlike videos about how grand it would be if those yucky humans went away and comic books about how the IPCC saved the Earth. And CBC Kids News still loves Greta Thunberg, even if China's had quite enough of that particular farmer kid, which is one thing in her favor. CBC Kids also explains the whole warming thing in simple declarative sentences in case reasoning is just too hard for anyone who's not a climate scientist. For instance, the film and TV undergrad at NYU who recently declared, quote, correctly solving climate change means dismantling all the systems of oppression that caused it in the first place. It's not a matter of choosing between, say, Black Lives Matter or climate justice. Climate justice is Black Lives Matter, end quote. Gosh, it's all so simple. We just dismantle all systems of oppression and life gets better. Why didn't we think of that sooner? Meanwhile, someone at the University of Sydney isn't quite sure whether to trust us with the news that the promised Green New Deal is built on air. See, apparently, instead of allowing us to continue to prosper without fossil fuels, alternative energy will allow us to realize that prosperity stank anyway, but we were too dumb to notice. So can we now be trusted to think about it? Language like, quote, the first comprehensive comparison of degrowth scenarios with established pathways to limit climate change highlights the risk of over-reliance on carbon dioxide removal, renewable energy, and energy efficiency to support continued global growth, end quote, suggests not. But then they say in English that, quote, a degrowth society could include a shorter working week, resulting in reduced unemployment alongside increasing productivity and stable economic output, universal basic services independent of income for necessities, i.e. food, healthcare, transport, limits on maximum income and wealth, enabling a universal basic income to be increased and reducing inequality rather than increasing inequality as is the current global trend, end quote. Wow, and then we dismantle all structures of oppression. So who are the experts making this forecast? Well, one's a guy doing a master's on degrowth and the other's a nuclear physicist. Would it be unkind to say that neither of them is an economic scientist? Meanwhile, two professors warned recently in Maclean's that, quote, climate action is going to create too many jobs, end quote. Which, as Henry Hazlitt observed nearly a century ago, isn't that impressive a trick. It's true of any step that destroys efficiency and reduces wealth. People have to work harder for whatever they get. So there is an important truth lurking somewhere in this very dry version of the whole Earth catalog. The orthodox prescription for an energy transition without pain is nonsense. And if we follow apostles of the Green New Deal, like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, we will end up somewhere very different from where we are, but also very different from where they say we'll end up. Which is something worth knowing, especially if you're willing to think about it like an adult. In the newsletter, we also offer you a paraphrase of recent IPCC conclusions that run so counter to glim alarmist slogans that we expect Facebook's alarm bells to sound. And this week's provocation, quote, What's the panic about 1.5 degrees of warming? As long as farmers know how to adapt to changes in seasonal weather, which they do, extra CO2 and a bit of warming will be good for most kinds of agriculture in most places around the world. In most places, our main food crops would probably do better even with 3 degrees of warming, end quote. ding a ling a ling a ling a ling Except that actually paraphrases the IPCC's fifth assessment report working group, number 2, chapter 7, called Food Security and Food Production Systems, specifically Figure 7.4, which you're currently looking at, and which shows what happens to maize, wheat, and rice, both outside and inside the tropics, that's left and right, and with red dots if farmers are too dumb to change their behavior when it warms up, and blue if they're smart enough to try. And you'll notice in, there's no Farmageddon in sight. The newsletter also has, from CO2 Science, something to wake you up, a study of what more CO2 does to coffee the good stuff, Café Arabica, under changing light conditions. Turns out, it likes the stuff and it likes light. So I guess it's morning coffee. Haha, <laughs> but seriously, folks. Let's talk Morris Alba. Again from CO2Science.org, it turns out that CO2, being the primary source of carbon for plants, is a carbon fertilizer. In this case, for mulberry, though you can also see it on your street. And with that plug for Dr. Seuss, we once again risk cancellation. But meanwhile, please share our work, subscribe including on Rumble, and send us cash. For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson, and the power is still on for now.